Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar. The purpose of this webinar is to review the solicitation for the statewide recidivism reduction planning grant to be awarded in FY 2015. Throughout the webinar, we'll use SRR to refer to this grant program. My name is Heather Tubman Carbone. I'm a policy analyst at Council of State Governments Justice Center, and I'll be presenting today along with Ruby Kozlobosch, Associate Deputy Director at the Bureau of Justice Assistance, U.S. Department of Justice. And I'm excited to share that we are also joined by Director Jane Neal of the Georgia Governor's Office of Transition, Support, and Reentry, a current SRR grantee. Thanks to all of you for joining the webinar and to BJA in Georgia for partnering with us on this presentation. Before getting started, I'd like to briefly talk about a couple of housekeeping items about how the webinar is going to work. At any time during this webinar, you can ask a question by typing it into the Q&A panel on the bottom right-hand portion of your screen. This includes both technical and content-related questions. We will try to reply to technical questions in the chat window as we move along. For the content-related questions, we will keep a running list and address them all at the end of the webinar. We'll do our best to get through as many questions as possible. If you encounter any technical or audio problems during this webinar and are unable to resolve them with our advice, please call WebEx Technical Support at 1-866-229-3239. Please understand that there are some technical issues that we may not be able to resolve. For this reason, we are recording the content portion of this webinar and we will post it on our website at csgjusticecenter.org slash nrrc. We should have the webinar posted online early next week. Once it has been posted, we will email all registrants to the webinar a link to the recording. Before getting into the details of the grant program and solicitation, we'd like to take a quick poll to learn more about who is on the line. In your right-hand column at the bottom of your screen, you should see two questions. Please indicate the type of organization that you work for and the state in which you work. And we'll just give everyone a couple seconds to respond. Great, it looks like we've got some folks from all over the country, and we're excited that there's so much interest in this grant program, and we hope that you'll find this information helpful to inform your applications. So today's webinar is organized into four parts. First, we'll provide an overview of the SRR grant program, including its origins and purpose. We'll also hear from Director Jay Neal about Georgia's recent experience with a planning grant and how that has informed their current implementation work. Then we'll spend the majority of the webinar digging into the specifics of the application process. We will wrap up with a question and answer session. We'll start with a program overview. I'm going to turn the microphone over to Ruby Kozlobosch with CJA to tell you a bit about the origins of the SRR program and to provide a high-level overview of this grant track. Ruby? Great. Thanks so much, Heather. Um, as most folks know, the Second Chance Act was signed into law by then-President Bush uh, in 2008, um, and it's currently actually up for reauthorization. A reauthorization was introduced uh, in the last congressional session, and um, we are expecting that it will be reintroduced as it didn't um, pass in the, the new congressional uh, session that just started um, in January of this year. But what the Second Chance Act um, does a lot of things, and in part it authorizes different um, grant opportunities for state governments, local governments, and tribal governments, um, as well as for some select um, sections or programs for nonprofit organizations. Um, to support programs, policies, and practices that reduce recidivism. Um, this particular 
um, grant program is funded under Section 101 of the Second Chance Act, and it was conceived of and announced at a, a, an event that we had in the District of Columbia back in December of 2011, uh, which was really a um, sea change of a conversation where we had state leaders and representatives from corrections and state legislatures, the judicial branches of almost all 50 states, where we really talked about the shift um, in responsibility to departments of, of correction around uh, policy practice and program change geared toward recidivism reduction. And the program has certainly matured a lot since then, and, and we feel as if we have a very good model working for us now. On the next slide, Heather's going to help me advance. You can see um, that overall recidivism rates really have, have remained pretty stubbornly high, with some exceptions. The, as you see, the, the darker um, blue states have seen the largest decreases in recidivism, followed by the light blue states there have had um, a smaller 0 to 10 percent um, decline, and then some of the um, other states are, are also highlighted there. On the next slide, <clears throat> really take a look at the scope of the Statewide Recidivism Reduction Program, or SRR, as Heather mentioned that we'd be referring to it. And the purpose of this program is at this very high state level to focus on effective strategies for reducing recidivism and enhancing public safety. And we do that in these, these number of ways. So even though it is statewide and there's a large focus on policy and on systems reform and change, there usually is a focus on a particular target population, and that's the target population that's identified um, using data and evidence um, that are responsible disproportionately for high recidivism rates. And then we go into the policy focus areas, so we're really looking at what kinds of risk and needs assessment tools are being used and how they're driving case planning, um, quality program that targets criminogenic needs, and then effective supervision practices post-release. And as I said, the types of investments that we're really expecting to uh, make through these grant awards are system-wide policy reforms and then the supporting things that are going to build capacity. And a lot of what we've been seeing that's been able to make a difference at the statewide level is um, investments in staff skills, in IT infrastructure, case management and assessment tools, and also building in, baking in a quality assurance process. And next, uh, the statewide recidivism reduction, the grant opportunities are really a mechanism to bring together stakeholders and develop the statewide strategic reentry plan. It can also help to build on an existing plan or tie together related initiatives. Um, and I'm so happy that we have Director Neal on board who can talk about the Georgia experience in, in, this, in this vein. Um, it's really also a high-profile opportunity to bring attention to a governor's goals for recidivism reduction. And then lastly, uh, this is an, an opportunity for the strategic planning phase, but you'll hear a little bit later that for select states that make it through a limited competition process, the state could have access to up to $3 million over the three years after the strategic planning process has been successfully com concluded to implement that plan. On the next slide, you'll see a couple of uh, quotes um, from, oh, let's see. Thanks. A <laughs> um, couple of quotes from Director A.T. Wall, of course, from Rhode Island, and then Director, um, outgoing Director Baldwin from the Iowa Department of, of um, Corrections, just talking about what these opportunities have meant for them, and they use the words empowering, intensive opportunities to bring together the right people throughout the state with a laser-like focus on recidivism reduction um, and being very specific yet sustainable way to get there. And on the next slide, um, so I've got the phases, Heather. Let me see where we I'm are. Sorry here. about that. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. Um, we have the phases, and this is what I was alluding to just a couple of slides ago. So in phase one, and that's what this solicitation is to bring things in for the planning and capacity building or strategic planning phase. We're looking to make up to seven awards or work with seven states 
um, in 2015. And then after that, those seven, to the extent that you successfully complete a strategic planning process, will be available to come in for a limited competition. So only those that receive 2015 strategic planning grants will be allowed to compete for the implementation dollars that will be available in 2016. And we are thinking that in 2016, this is pending, of course, appropriations, we'll be able to work with three grantees going forward. And the going forward part will be um, uh, dependent on success in moving towards goals and objectives. Thanks. And then the next slide here, the what is the what do we mean by planning capacity building? What are the steps in that process? That's what's laid out here. So it's establishing or reaffirming the collaborative decision making body that'll take you through the planning process. It's it's commitment to a data driven approach to recidivism reduction, how both how you understand um, what the issues are, what the rate is, how you set goals, and then you, how you plan to meet those goals. Um, thirdly, a, a real good look at assessing current recidivism reduction policies and taking a look at the gaps in implementation and barriers that you might have to get you to your reduction goals. And then lastly, as, as we've talked about, at the end of the year, it would be to put together that proposal for implementation. These are the states that we've worked with in the past, both from 2012 when we had a slightly different grant program structure, and 2013 was the, the first year that we implemented this type of approach, and we brought in 13 states in 2013 to work with on strategic plans, and then later in 2014, just last year, made awards to five states that we're hopeful we'll be able to continue to work with um, for two years beyond that for up to the $3 million in implementation funding. And at this point, I would love to kick it over to Director Jay Neal to talk about the experience as one of those grantees from the state of Georgia. Uh, um, one of, one of the, the things um, that I uh, have found unique about our experience in Georgia uh, is that uh, we have um, a governor that uh, when he came into office four years ago, came in focused on uh, criminal justice reform uh, in several areas, and we began uh, by establishing a, a council on criminal justice reform and uh, started looking at adult uh, sentencing reform uh, in 2012. We came back in, in 2013 and took on juvenile justice reform and uh, passed both of those unanimously and focused on what he calls the third leg uh, of reform, and that is reducing recidivism. So uh, we had in place already uh, a body that uh, was guiding our reform efforts, uh, and that was our Council on Criminal Justice Reform. Uh, so we began looking at, uh, at what we were doing in Georgia and, and uh, started uh, reviewing policies on supervision standards, for example, and uh, we, we've made some progress over the last several years leading into the, the grant cycle. Uh, but uh, as we began really looking at these policies, and we did so with uh, departments and agencies from around, uh, from every department agency in the state of Georgia together to, to look at what we do, how, how are we interacting uh, with these returning citizens when they come out of prison? What are we doing uh, to, to meet uh, uh, to meet their, their needs in, in uh, successful return. What are we doing to remove barriers and, uh, and fill gaps to provide the tools necessary? And one of the things we found uh, from the very beginning was that uh, our departments and agencies so much operate in silos uh, that even, even though we have uh, numerous uh, things in place already in the state of Georgia, uh, to provide services for these individuals. Most of our departments had no idea what the other departments uh, were doing. So we started working uh, in December of 2013, we started working together uh, to put in place the Georgia Prison Reentry Initiative, a uh, collaborative effort with all of our departments and agencies uh, looking at what uh, we need to do to, to remove barriers and fill gaps and uh, ultimately create uh, safer neighborhoods and better citizens by, by increasing the uh, success of these individuals coming out of the prison system. Uh, we then began uh, working on uh, the, uh, the, the, 
the implementation of the planning grant that we already had. And quite frankly, when I came into this office as Governor's Office of Transition Support and Reentry, I was not even aware that we had an SRR grant, uh, planning grant in place. And one of the first things I learned was that we had that planning grant in place. Uh, so we, we put the Georgia Prison Reentry Initiative and the SRR planning grant uh, together and we, we immediately started talking about this one plan, one strategy. Uh, we're not building a reentry plan on the one hand and then uh, building out a, a grant application on the other, but instead both of these are parcel and part of the same uh, effort and that's reducing recidivism here in the state of Georgia. Uh, we actually ended up not only applying for the SRR grant, but we applied for three other grants through BJA and all of them under the framework of that GAPRI uh, with this one plan, one strategy approach. Uh, so we began looking at the policies um, uh, on our supervision standards and utilizing graduated sanctions based on the risk needs assessment. Uh, we had just came out of um, uh, one of our criminal justice reform efforts. We had just um, uh, developed a, a next generation assessment, uh, which is validated on Georgia population for risk needs and responsivity, uh, using that uh, risk needs assessment to guide our decision making. Uh, we began looking at uh, our case management policies. Uh, one of the things that we're doing through our SRR grant uh, is we're providing a, a training for our staff on uh, uh, core correctional practices. Uh, we, we actually uh, have uh, as part of this one plan, one strategy, we, we actually have a smart supervision uh, where we're going to be uh, providing that enhanced supervision training for parole and probation officers in the community. But one of the things we did with this SRR grant was we included that same enhanced supervision training uh, for our correction officers in uh, an evidence-based learning facility. Uh, we uh, we are uh, designating one of our prisons uh, as that evidence-based learning uh, facility, providing enhanced supervision training for all of the correction officers in that facility. Uh, we are adding a, a director of evidence-based programming uh, that will be responsible for uh, all of the programming within the facility. We're adding three additional counselors within that facility. Uh, we, we, want, we hope to be able to, to demonstrate with this evidence-based learning facility uh, the kind of uh, successes we can have in reducing recidivism uh, by really following an evidence-based uh, programming uh, site within this uh, facility. And our hope is, uh, based on the successes we have here, uh, to begin take this, taking this out system-wide, uh, adding additional facilities as we move forward in the years to come. Uh, one of the things that we also did that I think was pretty important with our SRR, and we actually, by the way, right now uh, are having a, a data information implementation and performance uh, committee meeting. I, uh, I chaired that committee and, and uh, sat in for the first half hour before I, I broke away to, to join this call. Uh, and we're getting our first evaluation from the field already in spite of the fact that uh, we're only three months in uh, to our grant. Uh, and, and we're hearing some of the things that we anticipated hearing, some areas where we're doing good things and some areas where we're not quite where we need to be yet. Uh, so the, the quality assurance piece is a very important piece. And we'll, uh, we've got decision makers from corrections, probation, parole from our office, uh, from uh, Office of Planning and Budget and the Governor's Office that are a part of this committee to, uh, to really dig into to what we're doing uh, on the ground and make sure that we're utilizing evidence-based practices and we're delivering uh, those uh, uh, with, with fidelity within our, our sites. One of the things that we funded with SRR grant was a quality assurance protocol developer uh, position. Uh, this individual will work very closely with our evaluator and with each of our, uh, with each of our departments as we begin to address some of the things that we're actually talking about in another room right now. As we begin to address these going forward, we don't want to wait to the end of a three-year um, um, grant cycle and then look back and, and see our uh, our strengths and weaknesses and what we want to identify them as we go. We want to take the necessary steps uh, as we're moving forward to correct those weaknesses immediately uh, and, and to uh, assure that as we move forward, we uh, we're more uh, we're, we're we're having more fidelity in the delivery of our services. So. Uh, that we felt like that was a critical piece of uh, of what we're doing, and that quality assurance 
uh, individual, by the way, will also work with our community partners uh, to make sure that the, the timing and the dosage and the fidelity uh, the services being provided for our return citizens of the community uh, meet evidence-based practices as well. Uh, we also are looking at improving information sharing capacity among agencies and community stakeholders. We actually found that not only does the community not know much about uh, our return citizens that they're providing services for, but, uh, but we found that most of our probation and parole officers in the field uh, also know very little about the, uh, the risk needs uh, and case management plans of, of the individuals that are coming to their, to their caseload as well. So we're working to improve that uh, sharing capacity so that uh, our, not only our agencies but community stakeholders understand very clearly who they're working with, uh, what kind of um, uh, interventions they've had uh, through their, their time in the correctional system, what time of, type of interventions they need going forward. Uh, ultimately, and, and we're still in the process of developing this out, but ultimately we'll have a prescriptive case management plan that makes it very clear for the returning citizen, the staff, the community service providers, exactly what's needed for this individual to be able to expect a, a greater opportunity for them to be successful in their return. Uh, so that's kind of a, a highlight of, of what we've done uh, with our SRR grant here in the state of Georgia. Great, thank you so much, Director Neal. That was really great for me to hear about, and I'm sure the folks that are participating in the webinar too, especially to hear about the quality assurance and the information sharing um, that you're building into this process. I'm sure it's gonna assist with implementation, but then also sustaining these efforts after the grant funded portion is over. One, one um, of the things too, let me add this if I can. Yeah, sure. Uh, one of the things too that we did is uh, uh, we're setting up local reentry councils in and we've set up six and we'll be setting up five more in, in the coming months and then five more again next year uh, as part of this SRR planning grant uh, with some uh, positions being funded in the first year out of the grant and then the state picks them up uh, in the second year. And, and we identified, uh, and you talked about this a little earlier on the front end, we identified uh, the areas in, our, in the state that had the, the greatest number of individuals coming back to the community uh, and the highest uh, recidivism rate, and those were the areas where we uh, de determined, and, and, and the capacity also came into play, but ultimately we looked primarily at uh, the, the number of return citizens coming back and the recidivism rates in those communities. Uh, and, and then we, uh, as, as we began to, to look at, even within those sites, uh, we, we started with a high risk, high needs population as our priority population, and we'll go uh, as far as we can uh, with the population, but we understand very clearly that if we're going to impact statewide recidivism, the rate, the, the place for us to start is, is the areas that have the, the greatest number coming back and the highest recidivism rates, and ultimately by uh, targeting initially the, the highest risk and the highest need individuals coming back to those uh, specific communities. That is great. Thank you again for, for sharing the state's perspective and making sure that the, the state perspective was, was represented in all of this. And again, just kudos to Georgia for, for all that you've been able to do. And, and, and we thank, we, we just want to thank the, the council and, and BJA for your all's help with this. It was, um, it, it was an intense process that we went through, uh, working on all four of these grants at once and, and incorporating it into one plan and one strategy. But, uh, but y'all were, were so helpful to us along the way. Uh, didn't leave us hanging when we had questions and uh, uh, been, been a great partner through the process and we appreciate that very much. Thank you, and, and for those that are that are listening, I will go in and, and talk about uh, the resources and the support um, that the National Reentry Resource Council or Center actually will be um, providing for those applicants that are successful. There's a lot of support that comes along with the grant funding. Um, so on, next on the agenda, it, we're gonna talk about the program requirements and expectations. And so if we can flip to the next slide here, we can get going on that, and then we'll talk about how to actually apply for the grant, what goes into it, and then lastly we can get to some Q&A. 
So the solicitation itself is available here at this link. Applications are due to us on Tuesday, March 10th. We do use grants.gov. Um, that's how applications are submitted for most federal funding um, opportunities at this point. But for information about the Second Chance Act, other Second Chance Act funding opportunities, you can go either to BJA's website, also to the National Reentry Resource Center .org. Um, the NRRC or National Reentry Resource Center also posts federal agencies funding opportunities beyond the, the Department of Justice. So if you're interested in opportunities that are coming up through our partners at Health and Human Services, Department of Labor, Education, all those are posted there throughout the year. On the next slide, we really talk about our eligibility um, requirements, those that are eligible applicants. And um, important for folks to know that for this opportunity and for this opportunity only, the applicants are limited to state correctional agencies. So they've got to be at the state level. So we're thinking state departments of corrections or community corrections or the state administering agencies. And those are really the agencies that take in for the state, um, the state's criminal justice block grant dollars and are used to operating in a capacity where they can take in state criminal justice dollars and work with relevant agencies. And we thought that they would also be a good partner in this. Um, also to know as far as eligibility that states um, who were applicants of these funds in 2013 are not eligible to apply. We feel at this point it's important to make this opportunity available and to focus on states that haven't yet had the opportunity to engage in a planning process with us. So the next potential opportunity to apply for a planning grant like this um, for one of those states or those that just aren't able to get an application in this year would be 2017, again, pending appropriations and any other shift of priorities that might happen. So in the next slide, we talk about the award information. And as I said, we plan on making up to seven awards. And for the planning portion during this 12-month project period, it's $100,000 for the amount. Um, there is a match requirement. And that's down at the bottom here. You can see it's on pages 11 and 12 of the solicitation. And this is statutory, so it is a 50-50 match uh, requirement. So the um, uh, amount equal to the federal funds that you are requesting, a match needs to be provided. Um, the um, Second Chance Act and in the appropriations language in subsequent years under the Second Chance Act, there has been an opportunity provided for appli applicant jurisdictions to request a waiver of that match, um, but please refer to pages 11 and 12 in the solicitation because there's a lot of justification that needs to come along with that match waiver and the jurisdiction does need to provide and demonstrate in a lot of detail that there is such significant financial hardship that the entity would not be able to provide the match. Um, and then we've talked about this, that um, middle bullet there for future funding. Um, so we plan on making seven awards, planning and FY15, the year that we're currently in, and then up to three implementation awards in um, the future year with the, possible, the possibility of two additional supplemental awards on top of that. So this year, 100,000 in strategic planning dollars, and then for the following three years on a limited competition basis, up to $3 million over those next three fiscal years. We can go to the next slide, please. Now we'll dive into the goals, objectives, and um, deliverables for the grant program. So as we've talked about, um, we're using these funds to identify the drivers of recidivism in the state, and you heard Director Neal talk about that in two different ways. So um, what would be the target population that's driving it, and then another way you can look at it is geographically, um, what portions of the state are, are creating the most churn for recidivism. Um, through this opportunity, you're also going to identify that target population and the recidivism reduction goals for the state. You're going to review um, the alignment of your existing programs and practices with what the evidence says works and see where your gaps are, and that's going to help you um, plot out a, a plan and your implementation goals. And then you're going to use those statewide recidivism reduction, um, you're going to look to meet those, rather, um, goals using evidence-based practices. Next slide, please. Uh, I, these, these are in, in part a little bit repetitive from what we just talked about, so I'll just skim over these. So we're going to focus on those that are most likely to recidivate. We're going to use what we know works, what science is telling us um, um, 
through a level of rigor are going to work to reduce recidivism amongst those folks, deploy supervision policies and practices that balance both incentives and sanctions, incentives to include treatment, and we're going to target places uh, where crime and recidivism rates are the highest. And then the next slide. So that for the purposes of this solicitation, as is oft talked about, we do not have one national um, definition of recidivism, recidivism. So for the purposes of this solicitation, it can be defined in accordance with the definition that your agency uses. Um, it's got to be clearly articulated, though, in the application. And um, there needs to be evidence of an established historical baseline recidivism rate. Um, and also, we're looking for you to document the capacity to continue to track that rate according to the definition that you provided, both during the project period and then beyond, because we're really interested in outcome um, for these and other dollars and being able to track progress towards goals, both during the project of federal funding and even beyond becomes particularly important. Next, we're going to get into the mandatory requirements. and. Um, if when you're applying for this program and it is, it is not for the kind of, uh, it's, it's a little bit daunting, I'm going to be honest, as far as mandatory requirements. And the reason for that is they're directly written into the Second Chance Act. So these are statutory requirements. Of, of the um, 11 components that I'll go over, all but two or three of them come directly from the Second Chance Act itself and are baked in um, and ones that were important to the authorizers be a part of any application for funding. So we'll get to them. We'll start them on the next slide. And we see that the, the very first one here is a reentry strategic plan that lays out um, a long-term reentry strategy and includes measurable annual as well as five-year performance outcomes. Um, the detailed reentry implementation schedule, and also there's a, a, a concern, of, as you've heard me talk um, over the last couple of minutes, about sustainability. Um, we want to see that that's being thought of already within the strategic planning process and, and being built from the beginning. Um, the third is we want to see documentation that reflects the establishment and the ongoing engagement of a reentry task force that includes the, the right folks that should be at the table. And then fourth, a discussion of the, the role of local government agencies, nonprofits, um, to ensure continuums of care and that um, you're basically getting the people around the table that are going to help you develop, implement, and then sustain that uh, viable reentry plan. So moving on to the next slide, we want to see extensive evidence of collaboration with state and local uh, government agencies, including the domains that you see listed there, which are pretty comprehensive. Um, also, an extensive discussion of the role of state corrections departments, community corrections agencies, and local jail correction systems because um, it doesn't stop, stop at rather at the state level, certainly not just for those unified systems, but um, it's baked into the second chance at that collaboration at the, at the local level is very important. And then seventh, and this is something that, that BJ agrees is very important, we want to see documentation that reflects the explicit support of the chief executive officer um, within the applicant state and how the office is going to remain informed and connected to the activities both from at the planning level and at the implementation level. On the next slide, we'll conclude the mandatory requirements. We're looking for a description of the evidence-based methodology and the outcome measures um, that the applicant will use to evaluate the program if funded, um, and a discussion of how the, the measurements will provide a valid impact assessment. Uh, ninth, a description of how the project could be broadly replicated if it's demonstrated to be effective. We're really interested in replication and transportability. If one jurisdiction can find um, out something, we're going to want to work with you to document that and transport that and share that with other jurisdictions. Um, tenth, there's strong interest in collateral consequences. We can come up with the best plans, but if we still have regulatory, rules-based, practice-based hurdles, um, for true reintegration of formerly incarcerated individuals into the community, we're still going to have issues with success in meeting those recidivism reduction goals. Just to note a resource here, um, the National Institute of um, Justice worked with the American Bar Association to do this national study on the collateral consequences of criminal convictions, and they found 38,000 
um, collateral consequences of criminal convictions that are listed here if you add up all the federal and state um, ones together, 38,000. And if you go to this link, um, you can drill down into them by topic area or by state um, to see what they are. And lastly, for a mandatory requirement, we're looking for a baseline recidivism rate for the proposed target population, including documentation that supports how that rate was developed and will continue to be tracked. Let's move on. Um, successful applicants are going to develop planning um, and a capacity building approach. And the first step of the development of the strategic plan is walking through very closely, and here's where we start to talk about the technical assistance that comes in, um, working through a planning and implementation guide. And this is where you'll work hand in hand with the National Reentry Resource Center, which is coordinated by the CSG Justice Center. Um, and the kind of support is going to include on-site visits, um, taking a look at the data that is being developed, um, and what the plan is, is shaping up like. And there is a lot of support that, that comes along the way. But in discussing the planning and capacity, applicants should really address the following eight requirements, and those begin on the, or begin and end on the next page. Um, this is if you as you work through these through the application review process, this is going to tell us um, what, how you'll be able to pull off um, the strategic planning process that you have the right people at the table, that you have commitment, and it'll tell us exactly what you're going to do with the technical assistance support over the 12 month um, project period of the grant. So you're going to provide that definition of recidivism. You're going to let us know what is your goal for recidivism reduction within a two year period. Again, we're going to want to see a demonstrated interest from leaders at the state level. Fourth, you're going to review um, your state's strengths and areas for improvement regarding strategies um, that are demonstrated to change behavior and reduce recidivism. So it's, a, it's an overview of what your state is currently doing and where the gaps might lie between current practice um, and evidence-based practice. Fifth, that you're going to describe exactly what the state will do over that 12-month planning period um, to identify what policies and practices need to be changed or altered. Um, demonstrate a commitment to share data. We've talked about this a little bit and to work closely with the TA provider, technical assistance provider. Um, demonstrate a commitment that if implementation funds are later awarded, that you'll hire a full-time experienced coordinator who can take you through the implementation of the plan. And then um, lastly, for as far as the planning and capacity building requirements, we want you to pre-identify us what types of intensive technical assistance are going to be of most value to you that, so that we can help shape that technical assistance from the onset. On the next slide, um, we are, applicants are encouraged to consider a partnership with a research organization that can begin to help you collect data, work with you on performance measurement, and potentially to conduct an evaluation. This is going to be more so important for those that are moving on into a funded implementation phase, but we think it's important to highlight this now because best to bring on um, a local research partner while the, you're in the plan development phase. Again, the technical assistance resources will be available through the National Reentry Resource Center, and they are intensive and designed to be helpful and to get you through um, to a, a comprehensive strategic plan at the end of the 12-month period. And then next, we are going to get into um, the solicitor, the application itself, and what it should include and what are the selection criteria that we use to weigh and weight applications and what's the weight that's associated with each one of these application components. So if we can move on to the next slide. Um, so this is what an application should include. You'll start with an abstract, which gives a high-level overview um, of the partners, the commitment, and what your planning process will look like. And then the program narrative is the heart of the application, and it includes the statement of the problem, program design, uh, capabilities and competencies, um, your ability to evaluate and sustain, and your plan for collecting data required for performance measurement. Next is the budget detail worksheet and a budget narrative. Um, you 
need to submit ideally both of these. You could submit just one, but it, you can't just have numbers and you can't just have words. So if you submit one or the other, for instance, a budget detail worksheet, you'd want to also include, if it's a chart or through footnotes, exactly what those funds will be spent on. And then there's some additional attachments um, that we'll go over later. So to start with the statement of the problem, first you're going to define the scope of the problem. You're going to define or tell, share with us how recidivism is defined within the state, um, how the rate is calculated and tracked and reported to policymakers. You're going to describe the state's recidivism reduction strategy to date, describe the state's current ability to target supervision and resources consistent with the individual's risk um, and need level. Describe what the state's current ability to ensure supervision and service quality, consistency, timing, and dosage, uh, and that dosage is appropriate. The geographic areas to which the highest concentration of released prisoners are returning, and then evidence of an established historical baseline recidivism rate and how you'll continue to track that during the length of the project period and beyond. Next is the program design section, and here you're going to clearly articulate the goal for the project, the recidivism reduction goal, the data sets that will need to be accessed during the planning period. You're going to want to identify those and talk about your capacity um, to pull data out that will be needed from those data sets. You'll address the planning capacity criteria that we just talked about, those eight criteria from a couple of slides ago. Um, you will present a statewide strategic planning process. Um, who's going to be a part of that process and how it will unfold. Um, include recommended changes in policy and practice. You're going to want to pre-identify those or at least um, zero in on how you will identify which policies and practices need to be evaluated and changed. And then describe the target population, how it will be identified for service delivery, and describe how the services um, might be delivered. And then the mandatory requirements that we talked about are on pages five and seven will be addressed in that area as well. Capabilities and competencies, and the weights have been listed along the way. For the statement of the problem, that's worth 15%. The program design and implementation, 35%. Again, that's the heart of the application. Um, and then capabilities and competencies at 25%. This gives us a sense of who's going to be running and staffing this project for you, who takes responsibility. Um, and then demonstration of executive leadership. We want to know that we're going to have high level and consistent um, commitment to this project along the way. And then capability of the implementing agency to bring together collaborative partners, get and analyze data. On the next slide, um, if implementation funds are available, you'll be reporting into our performance management tool. For those that are going through the strategic planning process, there's abbreviated performance measures, including these, which will be reported on, um, again, if funds are awarded. And on the next slide, we get to impact outcomes, evaluation, and sustainment. So you're going to talk about how performance is going to be documented. You're going to outline what data and information will be collected. And you're just going to discuss how this effort is going to be integrated into, into the state's justice system plans or commitments and how the program will be financially sustained um, over time and expected long-term results for the program. And that is at 10% of funding. And then lastly, the last selection criteria is the budget that is weighted at 10%. We want to see budgets that are complete, cost-effective, and allowable. Um, in the budget section of the solicitation, we list what allowable uses of funds are and also what are unallowable uses of funds. Um, you're going to include an appropriate percent for the total grant award that will be used for purposes of research, data collection, performance measurement, and assessment. And then you should also budget in um, travel to one Department of Justice sponsored grant meeting um, to cover the cost for a team of three to attend one meeting in the DC area for three days. Next we'll move to the additional attachments. And those include a project timeline, position descriptions for the key position or positions, letters of support from what you consider to be key partners or agencies, um, disclosure of any pending applications that you might have with any other funding source for similar activities. And then there's a questionnaire that gets at the organ, applicant organization's financial management and system of internal controls. And those are on pages 18 to 19 of the solicitation. 
So next is the contact information, and I actually have um, an update for if you if you have questions about submitting an application, the grants.gov customer support hotline is spot on. Um, for questions about specific requirements of this solicitation, I think as this was being inked and finished, we actually changed our call center. So I'm going to um, tell folks what the phone number is, but then also, Heather, if I can work with you to get out the correct information. It's, also, it's in the solicitation itself, too, um, but the correct phone number to call is 800-851-3420 with similar operating hours, but we'll get that out to, to folks in an email. And that brings us to the end of um, prepared um, discussion about the solicitation today, and I'm going to kick it back over to Heather, who's going to help me manage um, answering your questions. Sure. Well, thanks for sticking with us, folks. We hope this information has been helpful and has given you some clarity around who's eligible and of the requirements. So as um, as Ruby just shared, we're going to head into the question and answer session. Uh, some people have been entering questions into the Q&A box on the WebEx already. Please continue to do so. We'll get through as many questions as we can. And just as a reminder, you should see now on your screen some instructions in order to, uh, to enter questions. We've got quite a number of people on the line, so it's easiest if we can leave our line muted if everyone can uh, enter their questions in the Q&A box. If anyone's on the line who was unable to come in through WebEx, and so you, the only way to ask a question uh, would be verbally, there's a button on your screen, um, on the top right-hand side of your screen, that allows you to raise your hand. It should be a button that actually says raise your hand. If you have a question and you can't type it in, just go ahead, click that button, and we will unmute your line. So to get started with our questions, um, we've had quite a number come in. So the first question we had is whether slides are available or if they'll be available at some link later. Um, in fact, the slides will be available in PDF format shortly, and we should have a link shortly in the chat section on your screen uh, that will allow you to get to those links. So we'll include actually my contact information, uh, the call number, the updated number that Ruby just provided to you, um, as well as a link to the slides, all in that chat, chat section on your screen now. Uh, the next question we've gotten, um, I believe comes to us from New Jersey, and we've been asked if the state currently has no standing reentry task force, but would be forming one within a few months, and will include letters of commitment in the application, do you still qualify to apply for the solicitation? Now, Ruby, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that folks there would still qualify, that part of the purpose of this planning grant is to use those funds, funds to bring folks together and to develop the plan. Does that sound that's, accurate? That's correct. Great. Our next question. Are states which have already received funds eligible for this round? Um, so are, the person asking the question has specified, um, specifically asked whether folks who received funding in 2012, 2013, or 2014 are eligible. Uh, so that's actually a yes and a no. Folks who received funding in 2012 are eligible. However, folks who received funding in 2013 or 2014 are not eligible to apply for the FY15 grant program. That's right. Our next question asks, what are some incentives used with community-based partners? And we've also been asked whether there's a chance to provide incentives for offenders who participate. Unfortunately, there's not a, a super clear-cut uh, answer to this question in terms of, I think, what the expectation might be. Um, as you may have already um, gotten from the information we learned from Director Neal, the SIR grant program is really about building infrastructure for making statewide change. And so this grant program is dissimilar from other programs, such as the uh, BJ's Adult Demonstration Grants, for example, where in those grants, the funding is used to develop a program that will enroll participants and deliver, um, for example, deliver a service or a program, the SRR grants are really about involving stakeholders and getting programs um, to develop them to change policy. And so there's not necessarily a group of offenders who will be enrolled and to whom incentives could be provided. As far as community-based partners go, in the planning period, community-based partners should be brought in because they're certainly part of the reentry continuum. 
but there's not necessarily um, a place to pre be providing any incentives to them. Um, Ruby, is there anything you want to add to that? No, that, that was a great answer. The only thing that I would add is that if folks are interested in the adult de reentry demonstration program, um, that will be would be more targeted at the local or, or the state level at a particular target population and, and the provision or brokering of services to aid in the reentry process. That solicitation will be released a little bit later this winter slash spring, so folks should look out for that. Great, and the postings uh, for those solicitations will be available um, on BJA's website as well as on the National Reentry Resource Center's website. Another question we received asked whether the requirements of the SRR planning grant program will be sent to participants. Um, so yes, the requirements as listed in this webinar will be sent out because the slides from the webinar will be sent out. Um, you can also get to them at the link in the chat section. All of the requirements listed here are taken from the solicitation itself. So if you'd like to see a more narrative format uh, where everything's in one place, there will be a link. If you go to the chat section and go to the link to those slides, within the slides there's a link that will take you directly to the solicitation. Our next question asked whether this grant can be written and awarded to a county. Um, this grant is intended to be statewide and so um, eligible applicants are statewide entities. And if you go, um, again, if you want to click on the link back to the top of the slide, there's, there's one slide devoted to describing the types of entities that are eligible. I would encourage folks who are on the line representing any county entity um, to bring this to the attention of your state level folks. Um, that's certainly how other applications uh, have gotten started before. The last question we have listed at the moment asks whether previous grant applications are publicly available for review. Um, Ruby, I think that might be more in your department. The question was whether funded applications, successful applications are, are available? Yes. We have not um, pulled any for this one proactively. Um, in the past, we have gotten requests through the Freedom of Information Act for redacted um, funded applications. So through that means, um, we could make them available. So, right, are there any other questions at this time? I'll just give folks a minute to type any additional questions into that Q&A box. While we give folks another minute to answer questions, I'd like to just draw your attention to the chat box on your screen. And as I mentioned before, there are links to the presentation slides in that box. Also in the chat box is the updated number that Ruby shared if you have questions about the solicitation and about the, uh, submitting uh, your proposal for the solicitation. Additionally, you'll find my contact information and a link to National Reentry Resource Center. So if folks come up with any questions later um, or, or during the process of writing, uh, please feel free to contact us and, and we can either send along the information or connect you. We've gotten another question uh, from a private provider in Georgia who's interested in reentry and currently providing services in some of the transition centers, um, some of the adult reentry transition centers. Uh, the question is about who to contact to get involved in ongoing efforts in a state. Um, so to recap, um, as you heard from Director Neal, these efforts are already underway in Georgia, and so some folks in Georgia are interested in getting involved. Um, at this point, I would suggest that you reach out to uh, Director Neal to the Governor's Office of Transition and Reentry. I'm sure that their information is available online. If you're unable to, uh, to find that, please feel free to shoot us an email and we can forward that information on. Um, but we will not necessarily get involved in facilitating the relationship, but of course we, um, we will pass the information along. Any other questions from folks at this time? All right, well if there are no other questions, this concludes today's webinar. As I mentioned before, we will email a link to the recording of the presentation as well as a link to the PDF PowerPoint slides in the next week or so, and you can already get to that link if you go into the chat box.
So I encourage you to sign up for the Reentry Resource Center's newsletter. Um, a link to that website appears in your chat box as well. Thank you so much to Ruby and to Director Neal for presenting with us today, and thank you to everyone on the line for your participation and for your interest in the SRR Strategic Planning Program. Please don't hesitate to reach out to us with any further questions. Thanks so much, Heather. Thank you.